Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. He's back, we have Mr. Kenneth Shrupp, communications strategist and editor in chief of the California Review. Good to have you back on the program, how are you? I'm doing well today, thank you very much. Absolutely, we're gonna chop it up about social media censorship. Maybe we'll get into Elon Musk to a lesser extent. I don't want to presume what you know or believe about this big debate about Twitter and Facebook and others who may censor content. So if you would give us your sentiment and I would then opine. Sure, well, I think that the ongoing debate is really a matter of whether or not we think that we need a public square and what the role of the public square should be. In times of uh, of past, we used to have actual physical public squares where people would go to share ideas. These were called forums. If in Rome they had the Grand Forum, where people of the time would give speeches for hundreds to hear and debates to carry on for hours. Today, that's all gone on to the internet. We don't really have places like that in person anymore. On campuses, we don't really have a huge exchange of ideas because those all get shut down. Uh, online really is all that we have left. Uh, I think the same can be said of much of mainstream media. So for conservatives uh, who are, aren't able to have as large a voice in the, in the major uh, outlets like uh, NBC or the New York Times, the uh, internet and social media companies are the place where they can actually transmit their news and be heard. Um, Elon Musk's attempt to purchase Twitter, I think, is a reflection of a desire for a public square on the internet without making use of any government mandates like changing section 230, requiring companies to allow any kind of speech they want. All right, so let me go down the list here. Sure. Um, when you compare social media to the public square, let me tell you where you're misstepping, where you're mm-hmm. incorrect. One of the dynamics of the public square is that it was actually owned by the public. It was on public property. And because it was on public property, there were particular freedoms associated because government cannot infringe based on the First Amendment of the Constitution, your speech. Now, naturally, no freedom is absolute. You do agree with me on that, correct? Oh, of course, I mean, you're not allowed to be naked. You're allowed to commit or incite violence in the public square. That is correct. There are things you can't do. But I hear this comparison a lot. That social media is akin to the public square. Well, number one, the public square still exists. It's up to you to go to it or not. (laughs) Number two, the public square is owned by the public. 98% of what has been deemed a public square was government property in the middle of a particular community, in the middle of a town, typically the downtown area. So you can't make these comparisons on a factual basis because they are two very different entities. Social media is a private company. That's like saying, If we're going to start calling social media the public square, just because a lot of people frequent social media, what's to stop us from calling the arena that's privately held the public square? Because a lot of people in the population frequent the private arena. You know, I really love it when progressives come out and defend uh, private companies and private property rights when it comes to freedom of speech. Hey, look, 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 I agree, I agree that, that it is. It is private property, right? And they can choose what they want on or not on that. All I'm saying is Elon Musk would like to spend over $40 billion to purchase Twitter to create a public square. Because quite frankly, we don't have a well functioning public square in our republic. And without that, I'm not really sure that we're going to be able to work out the differences in policy that we need for the coming challenges in the next decade. We have big problems coming to term in the next 10 years. Yeah. And you think Elon Musk is going to solve them. So let me go to this part. <laughs> well, I don't think he's going to solve them. I think, yes. I, I think the platform, like have, having a public square would be a start okay. for the internet. All right, so let's talk about this. Let's, let's be adults, man, about the conversation. Okay. In order to engage on a social media platform, you do have to sign a user agreement that is a private company generated user agreement. To go to the public square, you had no such signature for the user agreement. Uh, let's go to the Elon Musk issue, all right? Okay. Number one, I, I cannot dismiss the reality that two weeks ago, roughly two weeks ago, we were talking about Elon Musk uh, making an illegal uh, or doing something illegal that 
netted him $156 million in profit, right? So oh, he, what was that? when he didn't disclose uh, his, his shares, mm-hmm. are you not aware of that? No. All right, so Elon Musk was 11 days late in a uh, to publicly declare that he had amassed a large stake in Twitter. Because of that 11 day delay, that omission earned him an additional $156 million. That's according to about 14 legal experts and securities expert. Uh, so that was the conversation two weeks ago that he committed this unlawful financial crime and okay. edit $156 million because of it. Now, after he was in the news for doing that alleged illegal activity, he then later said, oh, well, F it, I just buy all of Twitter then. I'm you know, hostile <laughs> takeover, right? And now what are we talking about, brother? We're not talking about the $156 million property made from the alleged illegal activity. We're not talking about his legal takeover of a company that he was just cited for doing something illegal with two weeks ago. So the whole narrative has changed. Now I'm just making that as a side note. Here's back, I'm back to a serious point, okay? okay. Um, let's talk about what Elon Musk is actually presenting. I don't have a lot of love for the guy personally, but I do weigh his sentiment on the facts. He's what uh, is called uh, an absolutist, all right? Free speech absolutist. Are you aware that he is a self-described free speech absolutist? Do you know that about him? Yeah. Okay, what does that mean? I don't know, <laughs> we'll see what we'll see, right? <laughs> okay, let me tell you what that means. So and a free speech absolutist simply means that there's an individual who believes so much in the principle of free speech that they would fight against any regulation thereof, even with a private company. Let me tell you why that's problematic. Do you have children or do you have young people, your mentor, younger brothers or sisters? You got some young folks around you? Well, not really, no. Okay. Um, but I can imagine that there's things that I wouldn't want them to see or hear. Right, okay, I'm a father. There are things I don't want my teenage daughter to see or hear. Uh, on, a, uh, on a platform that's privately held, she signed a user agreement. There were some things in that user agreement that said that they will make a good faith effort to protect her from, right? Okay, great, everybody signed this user agreement. Elon Musk, according to his um, free speech absolutist doctrine would say no. We're going to rip away all of these restrictions. We're going to allow the N word. We're going to allow rampant racism. We're going to allow all speech that's legal. Remember, saying the N word is not against the law. I don't want children, I don't want myself exposed. I don't want the communities that I love exposed to that kind of language on a platform that we signed a user agreement privately that said we wouldn't have that. He's saying we're gonna get rid of those restrictions. As long as the language is legal, we're going to allow it, which also will destroy any brand support. He even admitted that, that he said he's not doing this to make profit. He's doing this to save the world or some some you know Messiah-like garbage he spewed out the other day. So tell me your sentiment about that, that in his ideology, he would allow racism to run rampant on his version of Twitter. You okay with that? So here's what happens when, when, when if, he, if he does that, right? You allow anyone to say anything. Mm-hmm. Users are all gonna leave. You think the journalists are gonna stay on it? You think all these people are gonna stay on it? It's gonna become an empty shell and someone or a bunch of legacy groups are gonna band together and start a new one. And, and then Elon will have lost $40 billion. Okay. Guess what? I don't care. That's his prerogative, it's his money. So you, you, you think it's a good that's idea? Good. Okay, that's fine, all right, So, but do you think it's a good idea? You think it's a good idea for him to take over Twitter, eliminate these common sense restrictions, all right, to say what racism. Is com- what, what is a common sense restriction? Like you can't, I, I, you can't, you can't use racial tr- uh, terminology, racist terminology, on a social media platform and not be penalized for it. That's common sense to me. I, I think it's, I think it's reasonable to create an environment that people want to participate in that you have to remove certain kinds of swearing and, and racial, racial slurs. All right, that, well, that, that's Elon perfectly Musk reasonable. Disagrees with you. Oh, well, he's going to lose a lot of business, but that's okay. up to him. As you said earlier, pri- private property rights matter. If it's his company, he can do what he wants. Let's talk about 230, section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Because this, right, this comes into play here, right? So this is basically what it says. It says no provider or user 
of an interactive com, uh, computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Simply put, if I put something on one of these platforms, the platform is immune from prosecution, okay? Mm-hmm. But there's a good faith effort that must be maintained by the platform that says we will do our due diligence to regulate the platform. If you do not provide any level of due diligence to regulate the platform, courts will hold you contributorily negligent in the content that you did not publish. You simply allowed for the publishing. We've seen these publishers not only be civilly fined, but have been criminally charged when they have decided to simply ignore the other side of the rule known as 230, the section 230 rule. So what Elon Musk is submitting, dear brother, he's saying, that he's going to intentionally violate rule 230, but he still wants all the protections of rule 230 so that he's not personally or through way of his company liable for what happens on the platform. He wants his cake with icing and eating it, right? He wants all of it, he wants all the perks and benefits, but he doesn't wanna provide a good faith effort to regulate. You think that's appropriate or fair? Uh, well, I mean, the, the law as it is, is what's created a situation where that is possible, right? Section 230 is what allows the social media companies to effectively serve as both publishers and platforms. Um, there used to be a distinction between publishers and platforms before the internet. Publisher was someone like a newspaper where there's an editor looking at every word. And I'm like, okay, this is said, we're gonna be held responsible for whatever's published on here. Platform, AT&T. Um, if I want to go send a bunch of expletives or whatever, AT&T is not responsible for what I've sent. Um, right now, due to Section 30, social media companies tend to be able to act like publishers. And they can actually remove whatever they want. They have the full power to do that, while not being, well, typically not actually really being held liable for the content that's posted on there. Like a good faith effort. Like who knows? What, who knows what that even means? Who knows? Like have an AI algorithm that just automatically sorts out. Um, certain words or phrases or images? Or does that mean having content moderators go through and approve everything like a publisher? Who knows what that means? But um, as it is, Section 230 is what allows this lack of liability is what has allowed the internet to become what it is, which is, I mean, social media at least, which is a place where most people can post many things. Um, let me let me opine, man, because I sure. find it kind of interesting. On one hand, you're arguing for more people to have free speech opportunity on platforms. That was the idea behind 230. Right. 230 comes along to say, okay, because we want these platforms to encourage full participation. In order to do that, we need to strike a balance here with the law. In order to do that, we need to make sure that every single person on the planet cannot sue this one social media company or this one platform. But we also need to make sure that the companies are responsible for a good faith effort to regulate the content so that libel, um, harassment, things of that nature do not exist as a culture of that particular platform. And that's what good faith effort means. It doesn't mean they get it perfect, but that does mean a judge can look at it case by case and determine this is not a good faith effort or this is, right? So it provides protections. While at the same time, freedom for individuals to post. It protects your freedom of speech, obviously, because Congress is not making a law abridging it, which is the constitutional measure. So, but then you're arguing, it sounds like you're trying to make the other argument too, um, that you liked it when it was more restricted back in the day? No, no, I mean, what what I'm trying to get at is that the law wasn't perfect when it was created. It was created as a stopgap measure because people didn't understand the internet or what happened with it. The idea was to create, I think the idea was to create a actual digital public square. And this was this would this would give social but media you companies. Can't, brother, if the public square is not owned by the public. That's an important <laughs> distinction. All I public squares were owned the, by the public, brother, the, it was the, public the inter- property. I think but what I mean is like something that fulfills similar functions to that online. Okay. That the Are owner, you advocating that the owner for the US for. government to create its own social media platform? No, but there are plenty Why? of private. That, that would make it no. a public square. No, I mean, there are plenty of private individuals brother, who have the money and that time would to, make to do something it, like that. That would make it a public square. It would then fit your argument. If the government created a social media platform, you then have your public square. So why uh-huh. are you not advocating for that? 
Honestly, that's something I hadn't considered, and that could actually be a great idea. Who knows? I mean, who knows? Why not? All right, we should try it out. We should try it out. Change but, the fines and then some people. But but let's let's consider something else, right? Okay. Let's consider the fact that social media companies, you you you, uh, the progressives believe that there's not enough being done to censor things, right? There's not enough censorship of misinformation, etc. You know, Amy Klobuchar put it that. I think they and, could be better. Correct. I believe. Right. So. I think that in some ways there is too much censorship of certain things that progressives don't want out there, right? Like yeah. remember the Hunter Biden laptop story from the New York Post. Right before the election, Twitter took it down. If you posted a link to it, you were suspended. You got strikes against you. The link wouldn't show up. A year and a half later, the New York Times has confirmed everything in that story and everything on that laptop. The same thing can be said of the Wuhan lab leak hypothesis. Right? You're, if you're posting about that in 2020, you would have you would have been suspended off of these. Listen, I, I get your argument, and I'm running out of time. I have sure. one minute left before the next show. I completely get your argument about having disagreement with how the content is regulated. I think those are credible arguments um, case by case to make to the place that you sign or with the place that you signed a user agreement, right? You are one of the consumers. You have a right to say this is what I don't like about the establishment. To say that you want the government to fundamentally change the establishment is to say, well, I went and ordered food at a restaurant. I don't like the fact that my food was cold. And so now I want Congress to make a law that would make this illegal. Now you're going from a personal issue to now a public policy dynamic. That doesn't make sense, it doesn't fit here. No, what I'm saying is I, I don't want the government to have to make any new rules or change things because okay. quite frankly, they're just gonna screw it up like they always do, <laughs> okay? We have a crazy South African billionaire with enough cash to just buy a platform and try to do something a little bit better than what we have now. Yeah, but it will more To more, allow more about worse. that's what, well, we'll see. If it gets a lot worse, I'm going to leave. I'll get yeah. off there too. All right. So okay. you know, that, that's his loss. All right. So we'll see what happens, man. It, always a pleasure having you on the show, brother. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.